And it will be like this morning. We will have a, a reactor panel. And we have our speaker panel, and they will have a discussion together. And then we will open up the discussion to the floor as well. So please uh, join us. And I will first ask uh, Matt to start and to kick off. Okay. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Maybe. Uh, my name is Matt Reynolds. I'm from East Carolina University. And uh, I just wanted to say that, that, that when I listened to the speakers earlier, to me, uh, special collections are immediately connected to use. Uh, without use, they are worthless. Um, it's just another dusty page box. And so when I hear people talk about the activities that should be associated with special collections or archives, I always look at it in, in, through the lens of increasing use, of, of ensuring that, that, that our holdings are, are of utility. Um, ultimately, uh, it's proving that utility that will uh, uh, keep the ball rolling for us, keep us relevant, um, and keep us funded. Uh, when Tim mentioned the, the need for self-examination and how important it was, uh, it is of paramount importance. The idea that, that self-examination can, can drive collection development to make sure that you are uh, acquiring um, materials that can be connected to the curriculum that can be seen of immediate utility, can be seen of use. Um, it just there, there, There's no way that you can, you can underestimate that need. Uh, when Lisa talked about assessment, I never thought I would say that I got excited about the idea of assessment. Um, write it down, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to hear it again. <laughs> but assessment is something that's incredibly difficult in a standard library setting, much less a special collections setting. Um, the new focus on this is quite heartening to me, um, but I just, you know, I hope that, that where I see a need that we, that we develop metrics that are not only uh, able to be used across special collections, but are able to be understood by larger campus administration who are very concerned with gate counts, who are very concerned with uh, number of volumes uh, circulated. We need to find metrics that are meaningful to them so they can understand the importance of what we do. Um, once again, these, uh, the, the assessment also will drive collection development, making sure that we keep things online. Um, the bottom line, and, and this is something that, that, that was mentioned, that, but I think bears mentioning again, is as uh, special collections librarians and archivists, is we, we are constantly fighting what I'd call the Umberto Echo Effect. Uh, for those of you who have read The, who have read, uh, the Name of the Rose, the, the, it is the classic medieval story of the librarian you know, being asked for the volume of Aristotle and shuffling off to the back behind the iron-bound door and being crabtastic, and in this case, giving the students poisoned pages for wanting to know too much. <laughs> um, we need to fight that. Uh, we need to make people know that it's open. We need to make people know that Special Collections is not a place for elite researchers. Even elite researchers were once freshmen. The way that I see us connecting to that is making sure that we insert Special Collections into the undergraduate curriculum at an early time. At my own institution, we have been, I think for seven or eight years now, have had a... Uh, an assignment that we've been working on in concert with the English department that brings second semester uh, undergraduate uh English composition students in. They go to our North Carolina collection, which is the state-focused part of our special collections. They select an artifact, not quite as you and I understand artifact, but a letter, a map, an image, and then they take it and they do the standard, put it in its historical context, the who, what, where, why, how that we all learn to do, especially those of us who came out of a historical background. But in that moment, we're teaching them the utility of such a collection the moment that they're in the door. We're showing them smiling faces behind our service desks. We're showing them people who are just thrilled to death that they're there and that we'll bend over backwards to help them. And then while we're teaching them to interact with these materials, we make sure that they understand that these are materials that can inform their scholarship from the first day they walk on campus to the day they receive their PhD assuming they want to go that far. I wasn't that much of a masochist myself. But that's what we fight, and, and, and these are the kinds of things that inform that. And then to go beyond what, to, to what Fran was talking about, um, that, that we should do well to, to, to remember that institutional memory is university archives. 
um, not only to make the students aware, but to leverage, to leverage university archives as a form of development. Um, right now, uh, NC State, which is a neighboring institution, is doing a wonderful project. You can look it up on the web when you get a chance called, uh, I believe it's the Red, White, and the Black. And it is a university archives uh, exhibit that uh, talks about the African American experience at NC State. And they've brought university archives to the students and to the public on their own terms. In this case, they put it out as a smartphone app. And you can walk around campus with your, with your geo what have you on. And it will read where you are on campus. It will give you snippets of oral histories. It will give you images. It will give you the campus history as you, as you walk across the campus. And that's how we make ourselves relevant. That's how we make ourselves get out there is we, we connect our holdings with experience. And beyond that, at my own institution, we just put up a university timeline. We recently digitized our, uh, our university annuals. We hope in the very near future to, put to, uh, to digitize the entire run of the student newspaper and several other uh, uh, runs of materials from our, our archives in order to not only you know, kind of serve that purpose of, of, of letting people visit what East Carolina University and what it is to be a pirate are. <laughs> But for the future donors to, look, to be able to look at themselves, to look at their memories, and to understand that uh, we are good stewards of the university's memory. And when it comes time for them to think of a donation, whether that be monetary, whether that be a personal collection of any sort, that we are the people who should be entrusted with that memory because we do it well and we should take care of it. Um, I don't think that that aspect of university, the university uh, archives can be underestimated enough. And when we talk about making sure that greater campus administration understands that the library is still the intellectual heart of the campus, uh, dollars and cents goes a long way towards convincing them. And, it, and it's sometimes sad to say, but it is the truth. But um, yeah, overall, this was a, it's been a great afternoon. And, and um, thanks for listening. I'm Rachel Hart. I'm from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and I'm delighted to be here to be part of this panel to share my enthusiasm and my love for my university's archives, and perhaps to tell you a story, going back to what Scott was saying at the very beginning, telling a story to illustrate the significance of the university's story for the wider community. Our university is 600 years old. So the material that I curate within Special Collections, because our institutional archive is a key part of Special Collections, has come to life over the last two or three years, and we've used the in university's history to really bring to life a university-wide theme. The university has branded itself as first and foremost Scotland's oldest university, the, th the third oldest university in the English-speaking world. These are brand things which the university is very proud of. And the story of the 500th anniversary of the university, we've managed to use to inform this 600th anniversary experience, which is all tied up with campaigning for funding, for outreach, and for publicity. It's the university selling itself to its present, its past community, and its future community. So it's part of our distinctive mission. It's part of who we are when we say we're part of St. Andrews University. It required me as archivist responsible for the university's history to actually be opportunistic, to look ahead a few years ago and think, well, here's 600 coming up. What can we do to set ourselves up so we're ready to go to meet the challenge? Think ahead of time about the questions that are going to be asked of the university archive. So to be proactive, to do that work that David was talking about the embedded librarian doing, summarizing, synthesizing, and presenting the story to those that need to know the story ahead of time so that you've got the information ready at your fingertips. That shared ownership of the story is something which we've been able to, to get across really well. And as a result, the 600th anniversary celebration in September 2013 is going to be modelled on the 500th story. And the archive has been used to structure 
that celebration. So there'll be special services, there'll be specially commissioned music, there'll be processions, there'll be key roles for honorary graduates, for people to send addresses to the university to commemorate its 600th anniversary. All these things happened at the 500th anniversary and the institution wouldn't have known about it unless I'd told them that that was what was going on 100 years ago. And they thought it was a great idea. They took it on board and they're going to mirror what happened. So there's a practical example of the way the university's history can be used to inform the present and to plan for the future. Now, obviously, the 100-year-ago story is very much an analogue story. But the fact that the archives are now at the forefront of people's memories is helping us to actually engage with the people who are talking about the digital record of the university. We have a huge challenge in St Andrews because we have never really grasped that nettle. And only recently has the university actually appointed somebody with an IT to think about managing, curating the digital story. And the library obviously is going to have to provide the facilities to manage that digital archival record and to be part of that ongoing story. So we are looking forward now to using the, the, the mirror, if you like, of the 500th to the 600th to now go from the 600th to the 700th and to say, if you don't do something about the, the, the records now that are not being curated, there will be no history for the 700th anniversary to look back on for the last 100 years. So it's actually a really good platform to launch off into the digital challenge for us. However, I would echo what Fran said about the chaos of university archives at the moment in the, um, in the 21st century digital challenge. Um, but the embedded archivist, the archivist that is out there working with the collections, knowing the collections from the inside out, surely is best equipped to actually tell the stories, to inform, to challenge those who are actually creating this data now and to actually encourage them to manage their data using the benefit of our knowledge of the collections of the record series that have been there for generations to actually inform the future curation of that material. I'd also just like to pick up on one other thing, perhaps which uh, Tracy said this morning about innovation at the margins. I thought that was a really interesting concept. The idea of special collections being able to do something new and distinctive and different. In St Andrews, we do teaching, we do engagement face to face with students, with faculty. We allow others to use our collections. We teach directly into um, our academic community. We teach everything from paleography, bibliographical studies. We unpack the medieval to the community. Um, but we also are dipping our toes into virtual reality, into the virtual world. There's an open virtual world program, which we're working with newly in computer science, where they're rebuilding a virtual cathedral. Our cathedral was built in the 1960s, so they're rebuilding a medieval cathedral in virtual sense. And there will be an app, which you'll be allowed to stand there with your iPad, and you'll see the virtual cathedral. And in that virtual cathedral, there are going to be virtual books which are held physically in our library. Book, a book particularly, a manuscript that was written in 1190, which is still within the university's curation, um, a manuscript work of Augustine of Hippo, a wonderful physical object which is going to be 3D scanned and put back virtually into the cathedral where it was written in 1190 so that somebody looking at the virtual cathedral can see the virtual books, the virtual title deeds, the documents that are held in the university's archive as part of this new environment. And that 3D modelling, that... Um, actual virtual reality is something which is new and different and which is coming about largely because of a young, dynamic, motivated new member of staff who is, is actually challenging the old stages, and I count myself as an old stager, to rethink the way that we engage with the new community and the new technologies. Daryl Green is really dynamic. I encourage you to look at his blog, um, Echoes from the Vault, St. Andrew's Rare Book Vault. Um, the blog is brilliant. It's, it's an engagement with what we're discovering as we catalogue. Um, it's a way of us actually touching base with a whole new community in a way that we haven't been able to do in St Andrews before. And this is very timely for us at a time when we are actually in physically very difficult 
circumstances, challenged by having moved our collections out of a building and actually being dependent on that 600th anniversary campaign for fundraising for a new centre for special collections. So the whole thing is a, a big circle for us. We're using the old to inform the present and to, to challenge for the new and to try to get ourselves better facilities and better, uh, better placed for the future. Sorry, soapbox over. <laughs> So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, special collections. And just briefly, then I'll start asking some questions that, that came to me as I was listening to the three panelists earlier. Um, when I started at George Washington University, which is almost exactly six years ago, I got there and was really spent the first month analyzing the collection policies that we had for special collections and realized it was entirely designed around an academic program that had ceased to exist four years before. Every single collection development policy we had for special collections was written explicitly for a local history of DC academic program that all the faculty had left. Um, and so I was talking to some colleagues and you know, saying, you know, is this where we want to really take this? And they said, well, you know, these are the crown jewels of the, of the library collection. I said, yeah, but crown jewels, if they're just crown jewels, can be sold off to you know, fund something else. We don't want to be crown jewels. We want to be really integrated into the academic mission of the university. Otherwise, we will just be seen as an unnecessary expense. Because frankly, special collections, if they've increased, in, you know, in, and they, I, they have uh, around the country by 300% in you know, the last decade or so in terms of the physical volume that they're that, uh, occupying, that's a, that's a very real expense construction expense, storage expense. Um, so some of the things that Tim was talking about really uh, resonated to me about that. So one of the things that uh, I did is I got the staff together in special collections. I said, let's take a look at our local history collections and see how they relate to the ongoing academic programs on campus. And where we had this one large uh, collection development policy for special collections that addressed all the different types of stuff that we acquired. So let's break it out. We've got a very active um, English and poetry program on campus, and we have a very strong set of uh, collections of local area poets. Let's conceptualize it in that way. And so, and we just we did this for every single area that we could, we could identify where there were unique groupings of materials in our holdings that resonated with the academic program or programs on campus, and then we started highlighting them that way. And we did the unthinkable. We went through and we started deaccessioning collections that really did not fit in any way, shape, or form with our academic mission of the university. And I'm not talking about you know things that were fads, academic fads, in, the, in terms of... Uh, where the university was going, but, the, but those programs that were clearly established or which clearly had the support of the university, we kept those the collections that supported those, and we did do some deaccessioning of things that did not fit. Uh, the other thing that, well, one of the things that, that transpired from that is we started realizing we had some interesting political related collections which really resonated with the uh, focus on politics and governance at GW. And this created an interesting opportunity where we were, had a major donor who, uh, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, came to us. They wanted to donate their, their records. And I said, well, it does resonate with some of our political collections, but one of our problems is, as I see it, what, listening to you, what I'm hearing is a need for a, a rich engagement in the, the history of labor in the United States. GW at this time primarily has courses that teach how to manage, isolate, control, and keep at arm's distance organized labor. So I'm not sure we're the best fit for you. The fabulous collections, believe me, I understand the value. I would love to take them, but here's my concern. Well, that conversation turned into a really interesting opportunity. And, and on the way, 
back from lunch. They said, well, how much would it cost to endow a labor historian? <laughs> Let's go talk to development. A few steps further, how much would it cost to endow a labor archivist? I said, we're definitely talking to development. Um, and ultimately, it, it turned into a $7.5 million uh, partnership between GW and the university. We now have a la an endowed labor historian position in the history department, an endowed archivist position in special collections. We have a million dollar preservation endowment to pay for uh, either staffing to digitally reformat materials or any other expenses related to uh, physically maintaining the collection and a $2.053 million um, labor history center complete with two-thirds of a million dollars worth of high-end digitization equipment. This model got the attention of the senior administration of the university, as you might imagine. <laughs> we've replicated it twice since then. So we've actually gotten, in the last four years, three endowed professorships, three endowed librarian positions, and several million dollars worth of preservation endowments. To um, we've learned, as we've gone through that process, some of our first ones, first in agreements really did lock us very tightly into specific uh, and, and, and an important but nevertheless limiting um, ag agreements. And we've got better at writing the MOUs. Uh, but one of the things that we, we have seen because of this is that the library system has gone from the very bottom of the barrel in terms of units that were raising funds and resources for the university to when the top three. And with that, we've gotten a lot of support from the senior administration of the university, of course, and senior development officers. And this has been a two-edged sword. One of the things that we're having to learn to do is bring um, our development officers along because they now think, oh, if we accept a collection, we can, ex we can get m money with it. And so there is a real risk of us losing the appropriate academic, I don't want to use the word control, but the academic management of the shape of the collections because we, and we have had situations where development officers after we've said, no, we simply don't want that collection. It doesn't fit the academic uh, nature of our of, of the libraries and the university have gone ahead and accepted collections, committed the libraries to significant amounts of work. And this is an opportunity to ask the panel. Have you, have you guys run into similar situations and, and or had really positive outcomes working with your, with your development officers? And do you have any advice on how to ensure that the uh, relationship with your development officers results in a positive outcome for the university and for the library? So um, the answer is yes and no. I mean, I certainly have had um, wonderful experiences with development officers and had very puzzling ones, too. And so I think it's really a part of um, uh, is engagement. I think um, it's it's a really, in the last, particularly the last couple of decades within special collections, I think they were, in, and with libraries in general, you know, development is sort of where the libraries and special collections to sort of the, the university level of fundraising, we're really sort of late to the game uh, that in sort of thinking in ways. I, you know, their, their collections, you know, you look back now that we've taken from active organizations, like, why didn't you ask for money when you're doing it? Because by taking in those archives, mm -hmm. you were saving those organizations so much, so much money, and so that kind of working in the partnership with the with university development really helps you have that conversation and give you the language. But it is part of the education to understand that, like you know, the yes, we get in these great gifts, and they they bring they bring a lot of stature and and support to the university, and a lot of times money too. But not all of them are good fits, and they and they they do take up a lot of resources. When you make a you know a hundred to two hundred feet of record uh, mistake, you know it's uh, or you have all of a sudden have that foisted on you with no funds, which has happened to me in some cases, and not, not my current repository. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, that is one of the... Um one of the things I think is really, you know, you have to just really be very proactive, I think, in working with your with your library and university development officers so they understand um, the implications and on, and the benefits. But I think ultimately it really benefits the library to have that kind of active in, engagement and presence. And it's interesting, you know, bringing into the, sort of the benefits of university archives and the, the library, that was actually one of the things when, particularly when I was at Duke as university archivist, I had a different kind of connection with the development officer, sort of the, the keeper of the flame for the institutional memory mm -hmm. that really was 
was actually an added benefit for the library because a lot of times, with, but for me within archives, I could I could help continue that larger education about what the library's mission was just beyond the the archives things, uh, university archives focus. But I, I, it really is, it does take active engagement. We talked about being embedded with academic departments, but you really do need to be embedded with your your, your uh, library and and campus development offices. Well, and, and not just the uh, the development officer assigned to the library either. I think um, one of the benefits uh, uh, that in my current institution is our development officer calls on her colleagues quite often. Um, and we um, have in a couple of cases tapped in to other um, development officers as the case calls for. Um, so, and our university archives also is often called on by university development to find out the background. Um, um, of uh, somebody or somebody's father or something. So um, I think uh, it's absolutely critical to um, have a really great relationship with the library or the uh, development officer who's assigned to the library, but it's also uh, important that he or she is spreading the news amongst their colleagues as well. One of the things about the development environment at GW is that we used to have a, an all or nothing approach to, to credit for development. In other words, the development officer who signed the deal, even if, the, if they had had 30% of the effort to get the, the, the deal signed from another development officer, um, they would get 100% of the credit. So there was no incentive to actually collaborating with peers in other parts of the university. We actually now get the, the, the people who are in development do get proportional uh, credit. And that's actually enabled us to really collaborate very closely between special collections. Our library is development officer signed to us by Central Development and her peers in other schools. And so some of the successes we've had lately have really been because we've been able to make this really obviously is a win-win for every part of the university that's been touched by the development effort. So one of the things that we're encountering, and, and uh, I'm just wondering if, if others here are encountering the same thing, is that when we do get gift collections, um, and increasingly, you know, as we said, they're resonating with where the university is going, and, and it's, it's very much part of uh, how the university sees itself. Um, is the, 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 our donors expect us to digitize everything they donate? And again, there's a, a learning opportunity, a teaching opportunity with our, our development colleagues because they're they're. Uh, Perhaps their level of sophistication of understanding what it takes to do real digitization may not be what our understanding might be. I was wondering if any others others here have had the situation where uh, collections are coming in and there are agreements being made about uh, the digitization and how that fits in with larger digital initiatives around special collections. We get that. I guess we all get that question, uh, and the assumption is, you know, you just digitize it, and uh, you know, no problem. Uh, but um, uh, it is a problem, and um, we don't do it. Um, so, uh, uh, if that's a deal breaker, then it's a deal breaker, um, uh, unless there's 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 sufficient support. <laughs> The, the, the head of our special collections has, has gone a long way towards, uh, I guess the word protecting us uh, would be the best way to do it. But we're in the process now of uh, this fall we'll be putting together sort of a, a digitization advisory board that would uh, allow us to, to in a way deflect some of those uh, some of those requests that we just may not be able to, to, to service. And beyond that, uh, help develop uh, guidelines essentially that that we can point to and, and and sort of hopefully stop a significant number of those before they even make it through the door I think it is a real a, a fairly significant challenge because I've been in several situations where we actually have donors who are willing to pay the cost of digitization but there's already higher priority things which we already have tied into various curriculum packets and other other things you know, that are you know ahead of it and there, there may be good value for digitizing this collection but it's sometimes you just can't put it to the head of the line even if it is a, you know something that you do would want to eventually digitize anyway Way. Um, so it is. It is a very uh, big challenge because we always, you know, like to say, you know, scanning is cheap, but storage and metadata is expensive.
it. Um, it's and, and so to trying to explain that to the donors, yeah, it's, it is very easy to quick, quickly scan something, but to be able to do something meaningful with it is uh, is another another challenge. Now we have done a few things that um, like for smaller collections, we put representative things up very quickly on on uh, like a social media site like Flickr, um, and that sometimes satisfies uh, as well and gives sort of some quick access. But it's it's different than going through our formal digitization project. But that that sometimes is a, is a compromise thing. But generally, try to it's sort of like those restrictive endowment agreements and other things. Try to really avoid getting sort of painted in a corner with uh, you know with the expectations for that. But you know, many donors though do really think you can just sort of you know very quickly as part of the whole. And we'll you know maybe we will one day, but it's not we're not there yet. Um, be able to you know, just do it as part of processing it and making it available. So one question I've got uh, for, for everyone here on the panel. Um, it, it occurs to me that the archival and manuscripts tradition and the library tradition had been separate for about 100 years. And in an interesting way, because of the advances or, or conceptual work that's been done in archives and manuscripts in terms of digital collections and digital content, that there's this interesting merger of the two traditions back into a single tradition in interesting ways. And I'm wondering, kind of pushing that thought a little bit further, if we might not be seeing an, it's an opportunity or situation where some of the, the approaches that we've taken when selecting and, and identifying content for special collections might not be some of the same insights or, or methodologies we might need to bring to bear to identify uh, online content out in the net that we need to grab and bring back for our scholars and to build unique collections or aggregations of content. And it's not traditional special collections, it's not traditional collection development, but there's this interesting opportunity where the, the two traditions are bringing insights that are merging and could perhaps lead us to some interesting outcomes and that would benefit the academic programs at our institutions. I'm thinking including web archiving, for example. I was wondering if anyone has any thoughts on that. When I was at Duke, I actually started a web archiving program. It started off uh, primarily as institutional records, but then quickly our collectors, particularly in the various subject areas, we had a collect women's history collection, um, did collecting in um, online literature and um, some other areas, quickly saw, saw the real benefit of being able to, to, to do web harvesting and gathering in sort of collected areas like that. And um, since I've left Duke, they've actually expanded the, the web harvesting service. They use the Internet Archives Archivate service and actually have, besides the University Archives collections, now have collections in these other areas and start aggregating content. They, um, Duke also did an experiment where they actually um, set up a, uh, a collection where they actually let a faculty member sort of guide the crawls for a while to build an area that, that this particular faculty member was studying to sort of you know, do it was uh, do uh, websites. It was all sort of the use of the um, uh, so, uh, social media in the Middle East and sort of looking at sort of trying to grab some of those sites and do like that. So I think there's a real I think that's a, that, that's a real emerging area that I think there's a lot of potential for um, development in. and and I, I see this again. We talk about this services we do to support scholarly activity um, as sort of web, web harvesting and these kind of tools where you can do these sort of self-directed crawls and make things uh, available. I think that it really opens up a whole new avenue of, of, of building content and supporting the research agenda on campus. Right. So the one thing I would say about that is that um, I think you've archives and special collections then find themselves in a conversation about whether they're a preservation entity for that, um, the web thing that they pulled, or whether they're just uh, linking to it and um, leading people to that as well. Uh, we have a question in the audience. Uh, thank you. We actually had a virtual question submitted from Jan Robertson at University of Utah for Tim. And can you tell us again the membership of your task force that was formed? Sure. So the, the task force we did for the collection assessment was, were three subject specialists from the library, library um, and then um, a non-library uh, non faculty member. Actually, the faculty member we chose was very interesting. He's actually a geology faculty member, but he does very creative interdisciplinary uh, research doing, um, he actually likes to go through uh, lots of different historical uh, records there, doing some GIS tagging and different kind of things. So he uses the collections in a way that's very different than sort of the traditional special collections user, and so, but, um, but and uses just a, an incredible incredible wide range of materials, so uh, was a really good person to, to consider. And then we had the, 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 the library's assessment officer um, who does a lot of the, the metrics, and so obviously very good in sort of thinking at the data points for that. And then the director of development for the, for the library, uh, again, who's uh, been very active and very, uh, very proactive in sort of helping identify collections and funding sources for special collections, and also is very, um, very uh, good about working in partnership with us for, uh, for with, with collections. So again, it was really kind of a nice sort of all 
all external, but it sort of everyone sort of had um, uh, a little little different interest in the co in the collection. Within the subject specialists, we had a uh, a person from the life sciences, uh, a person from our art and architecture collection, and a person from our literature collections. And so the the life sciences was probably the weakest of what we had in our collections, but we definitely wanted to have someone from the sciences because Penn State's collections and the general library are very strong in that area. And so that's one of the areas where we're sort of looking at what is the role of special collections in that area because it's not a, been a traditional strength for us. So it was really kind of a nice nice group and they really have asked a lot of tough questions. <laughs> Can I ask why you have excluded a special collections representative on that panel? I, I did it on, on purpose. One of the things is that we're such a nice group of people um, <laughs> that if, you know, if there is a dissenting opinion from one of the, if I put one of the curators or some, something on there and they, they sort of the, the group wanted to go in a, a different direction, I worried about a little bit of sense of bias on that. And the curators and myself and other staff are all good data points. They've all been extensively interviewed by the group. So there's there's definitely that whole um, whole bit of participation. And then the recommendations for that will come back from the task force will come to myself and the curators to go over. So they'll, they'll be very actively engaged. But they're just, I felt like there was a real value in having a group that was external to the actual special collection staff look at our collecting. And there's also basically sort of also that kind of getting the buy-in from the library. I really was very, uh, the main library is I felt like there was a little bit of distance between how we built our collections and the rest of the library. And I thought this would be a real good way to sort of to bring us closer together. So that was uh, all sort of part of my idea about using the Method, methodology of not having an actual special collection staff member on the on the task force. I'd like to thank you all for your very outstanding presentations. I'm Ron Becker from Rutgers University, and uh, I too have been thinking a lot about anniversaries because we're celebrating our 250th, and the state of New Jersey is celebrating its 350th. But I also, in looking around, I'm wondering about the next celebration and how different it's been from the past celebration. And one of the things we're doing is digitizing the New Jersey historical series that was done 50 years ago, books about New Jersey history and culture that were paid for by the the state. We no longer have the budget to do that now, so we're going to digitize them instead. But just looking at the titles, uh, the people of New Jersey, ethnic New Jersey, uh, cultural areas, things like that that have changed so much. And have we really changed with it in terms of what we collect? Uh, you look around a, a university like Rutgers now and many of our public universities, the number of Asian students, of students of color, what have you, are we really providing services and getting collections that document those communities? Um, New Jersey is going to be, a, is completely transformed already. And I'm wondering what it's going to be like for the next one. And are we really collecting the kind of collections right now and setting ourselves up with the kinds of services that are going to be relevant to that new group that are relevant now and will be in the future. So I just, I just have to say I grew up in a town that was 67% Mexican American and uh, because of that when I, I applied to library school my essay, my application essay was about how do we build multicultural resources, I mean library resources that really do meet the needs of uh, uh, underrepresented communities within, that are, that are silent in the historic record, not because they weren't there, but because we weren't collecting materials. And luckily at Stanford, where I worked for years, that's what I did my entire career at Stanford was work on collections of, of primarily of underrepresented groups that were cri critical to the success of, well, anyway. Um, and that has definitely been something that I've been making sure that we do at my current institution as well, is make sure that that we are actively collecting the entire, the, the whole spectrum of, of the communities in, that uh, GW does research in um, and about. So uh, we just, in fact, our university went from having no classes on the Mexican American experience to six. In one semester, it was six new classes were added, and we actually acquired a $10,000 collection of, of, of uh, rare and ephemeral publications to, to support that initiative. Anyway, so that's what we've done in my local setting. And I think one of the challenges in sort of uh, uh, some of the new and emerging communities that are happening around the country is they don't produce documentation in the same way that traditional society has done in the, the earlier parts of the 20th century and the 19th century. And so one of the things that we as special collections folks and archivists have to really do is think about differently about how we document. Um, oral history is the first thing that comes to mind. I, um, I know um, UNC, when I was, was there, was you really wanted to document the, the, the rise of the Latino community moving into North Carolina. And, 
and there wasn't a lot of sort of written documentation, so they started a very extensive oral history program to be able to capture that that experience. But then uh, Duke had a very strong documentary photography program that sort of did a lot of do documenting of some of the different communities. So I think thinking about that, and then also, you know, uh, again going back to web archiving, again I think that's another really good place because then a lot of times some of the, the communities they may not they may blog, they may have other kinds of ways that you can capture and, and record that data, but it's not in the sort of what was you know most special collections folks would consider the traditional format. So you have to be a little more creative in your documentation strategies for documenting these sort of a, a different communities. So um, oh, uh, Columbus is celebrating its 20th uh, anniversary as a city. And um, the Special Collections and Archives has um, really responded. They're going to do an exhibit here in the fall. Uh, the other nice thing about my position is I'm also I'm the Associate Director for Special Collections and Area Studies, and my Area Studies librarians are also responding um, with exhibits on their um, their related communities in Columbus. Um, so I'm looking forward to see how those two groups synergize around this idea of, of representing Columbus history through not only Special Collections and Archives, but also Area Studies librarians. Um, viewpoints and their connections to the community. Two hundred. What did I say? Oh, yeah. I no, I totally meant two two hundred. <laughs> yes, it's not quite that young a city. <laughs> yeah, I would just add on uh, the commemoration. Uh, University of Michigan's approaching its two hundredth uh, in 20, uh, 2017 and. Um, we are thinking about compiling a history, but uh, it will be entirely a web-based uh, uh, production. Um, uh, we've really decided that the age of the printed history is gone, and we have to establish a, a, a essentially a history web presence. And uh, the dynamics of that is quite different than for a publication, but uh, I think an important way to go. Night, my turn. <laughs> I'm Joan Swanekem from Yale University. We've had um, really in-depth area studies, global collections for many years. Um, but one of the things that's changed perhaps over the last 10 years is the realignment of our um, institutional programs um, in the area of global studies with um, new institutes. Um, our, we've got a new um, relationship with the university in Singapore. Um, but we are, if we're, the one area where we're buying more and more print materials are from most of the developing world, Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia. Um, our East Asia collections have been strong for a long time, but Latin America. And I'm wondering how your, if, you know, when you think about aligning these programs, you know, how, where do you, how do you start understanding what the, um, these area studies materials, which, which ones of those fit into um, special collections and how you begin to address some of those needs? Um, I see that happening for us, and I don't think we've got a complete handle on it. Our Divinity Library does some things. Our Manuscripts and Archives has huge pamphlet collections, but, mm -hmm. but I don't think we've got a comprehensive strategy yet. It, it. Interestingly, in St. Andrews, we have a, a very strong IR department, and we have an Iranian collection which has recently been collected in. Um, it's not a special collection. It's a main library collection because the IR students want it on open access. They want it accessible all the time. The material isn't necessarily old. It is special, but it, it's, it's there on open access as part of the, of the lending stock. Um, and that was an intentional decision that it wouldn't be closed or restricted in access um, to be used in a reading room context under supervision. It would be actually made available to the community. And that seems to have gone down very well. I think your uh, point is, is interesting, and, and I think it, it um, reinforces my own thought that the boundaries between special collections and collections as a whole is just really dissolving. Um, uh, I mean, physically, we have, have collections uh, or we're holdings in various physical spaces, so the idea that you walk through the stacks and encounter materials uh, all clustered together nicely is, is gone. Um, so uh, I, I think that just underscores uh, my own thought that um, you know, as, as, as curators and, and as librarians, we need to uncover the voices and what we have and be able to connect those voices to the questions that faculty are asking. It's, uh, it's an intellectual linkage uh, as much as a cataloging kind of issue. 
Um, I'm uh, interested in your question because it sounds very contemporary about um, you know the uh, histories that are currently um, sort of evolving out of you know existing communities um, or communities that are realizing their history is kind of being lost. Um, I'm kind of an interest in an interesting spot because I've got a lot of this happening uh, in both of my divisions. Um, my uh, Japanese librarians collected some manuscript material, um, which she's keeping in her office because she doesn't know where to put it. I'm like, talk to the books people um, but she's also been working with the cartoon library for a long long time to collect manga and what we found out recently is that we could free some of our manga that we were keeping as preservation copies because we're no longer we, we don't really hold that role and there are now archives in Japan who are fulfilling the role of preservation and what we heard from our faculty was that they didn't they couldn't assign these things because uh, students couldn't come to the reading room at, during certain hours so we made the recent decision to to free some of the materials, put them back in the circulating collections, um, because we know because because yeah. the the role has changed for those materials. They're no longer special collections. They're now more circulating collections. Uh, our Jewish studies librarian has been collecting Jewish ephemera and sheet music, um, and is just now collaborating with the music librarian and theater research institute and the cartoon library, who all have sheet music. Um, and the, it turns out that my Latin American um, librarian actually comes to that role newly from special collections. He was previously in special collections um, and was uh, uh, has uh, been working on um, fraternal organizations. Uh, so there's actually a lot of uh, synergy, but it's around the historical materials. And so I hope that my groups will be thinking about um, how to tackle the the you know the current communities and the and their the loss or not loss of their history in Columbus. I think you, you, uh, Lisa brings up a very important um, point in the in the, the with the the uh, topic of roles because that's one of the questions that we sort of ask: of what is the role with the collection? So we bring a so a collection like when you were area, area studies coming in, and one of our let's say like one of our area studies folks at Penn State wanted to bring that in, and then they were trying to decide whether it's a special collection. One of the big question then is it uniqueness? Is are you know are these the only copies in the U.S.? If they were to disappear, you know, could they be replaced? And so that's what some of the questions there when we talk about whether because again. Um, like Fran and the others were talking about, is it is I, you know if if it's something that can be in the open stacks, it is better. The students will use it, will use it more because it's op open more hours than we're able to make it to make it uh, make it available. So again, I think that kind of what is the role with the material is a big question to ask. How unique is it, and, and can you replace it if you put it out in the open stacks and it disappears? Thank you very much. So I, I, can't, I can't resist uh, surfacing some stuff that's gone back and forth on Twitter that I think the whole group would actually rec you know, enjoy some conversation from, uh, from the panel. So on the one hand, you've got what I see is an, an increasing tension between the talk about um, you know, usefulness, utility, establishing value, alignment with mission, and then, uh, and then people just had big problem when Matt said, if you're, they're not used, they're not useful. They're not valuable. Huge pushback Good. comes, <laughs> Good. oh no, we collect for the future, it's, for, it's the potential, et cetera, et cetera. Now, you know, that's a good professional debate it, 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 to have. It seems to me to be, going back to Scott this morning, a really lousy story to try and tell. So how do you reconcile what, you know, the energy that people are clearly giving to trying to, uh, you know, align, establish metrics, assess, and then have this other story that you have to tell about potential future, et cetera, et cetera. Well, give me a uh, second to, to hear to, from everybody. Give me a second to clarify my statement on use. I, I was not saying that if we don't use it, why should you collect it? I'm just saying if we collect it and it is not used, there's really the part to a certain extent there is just no point. I'm not saying, you know, obviously eventually it might be and you have to have an eye toward that, but I'm not saying that, you know, if it's not relevant now then we shouldn't pick it up. I'm just saying that it's our job as archivists and special collections librarians to find ways to tag those materials to the curriculum to where they do see use. It may not be relevant, well then let's find out a way, find out a way to make it relevant. Well, and I'd like to follow up on that um, real briefly and say that quite often um, the reason something's not used is exactly because you haven't described it in the right 
uh, way or in the right space or it hasn't surfaced. I mean, so many of our finding aids are not in our library catalogs. They're not, um, they don't rise to the top of a Google search um, and they're buried, buried, buried. And quite often the reason why materials aren't used is because nobody knows about them. So the trick is, can you do whatever you can to make it, you know, used and then um, hopefully somebody will pick it up. I've got to say too that there are creative ways of using collections that feel like they're not aligned um, because you could use them around a different mo me me mechanism of teaching. So for example, um, some of our uh, rare books content-wise may not be aligned with subjects on, uh, that are being taught or, or discussed on campus, but they are relevant to the history of the book or uh, some of our material science classes, like how it's put together. Uh, we had a chemistry student who did a lab project in the, uh, in, in the, in the um, preservation lab on uh, working with some of our materials and figuring out um, uh, where they had come from based on their um, construction and, and chemistry. So I think there are a lot of ways that you can make uh, materials and special collections relevant to see if they'll be picked up for use. And I think Sarah's got a comment. Uh, I'm Sarah Pritchett from Northwestern University. And uh, this seeming conflict that Jim was positing um, is one um, I, I've addressed um, even dating back quite some while ago, because I think it's a really critical conflict and we don't do a very good job of resolving it, that is um, making explicit to our institutions uh, the implications of this commitment to long-term cultural heritage. And if we don't work in an institution that doesn't see that as part of its mission, this above and beyond a given set of faculty or students, are we using university resources to collect for the future, which in many cases we are, there's nothing wrong with that if we can say to our institution, you know, are you there? Uh, some institutions will make that an institutional priority and some won't. But we very rarely actually point out these implications of, of collecting for the future. And I think we're only going to get buy-in from our institutions if we try to get them to think about what is their sense of obligation. Does our university feel a long-term obligation to its community or to be collecting national heritage? Uh, because I think that's the key to bringing those two things uh, together. It's still about alignment, and it can also be about collecting for the future. But if we go out there doing this very expensive and labor intensive work and the institution doesn't care, then that's when we see things like, you know, they're selling the famous painting uh, because it is not their obligation to collect cultural heritage. But we don't link those two things externally very frequently. We talk about it internally. We have to externalize the connection between those things. I, I just want to, I have three points on that because I think that's an interesting, Jim's and this other comment together are, are interesting. First of all, I, I think, um, and I'm hugely sympathetic to the cultural heritage argument, and I think there's all of us in our souls and in our being believe that's what we're doing. I think it's going to be, I mean, the economics of higher education are such that that's going to be a very difficult sale in, for the next generation. Uh, the cost squeeze at universities at, 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 across the board are such. Uh, 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 that that those kinds of things that are not directly connected to to what people are paying for uh, is going to be increasingly difficult. Uh, uh, so. Uh, two things. One, uh, I think we're going to have to work, as, as uh, some on the uh, table here are doing, to, to endow that work, uh, to find ways to, to remove the work from the pressures of university budgets to say, you know, it's being funded completely outside of tuition dollars and whatever. And second, I think, is to take charge, I think this is what I was trying to say in my presentation, uh, to take charge over over uh, uh, connecting the value of what the university has invested in, uh, connecting that value to the, the, to, to the curriculum. Uh, I mean, it's a big leap, and it's it, it, it would be a, it's going to be really hard to try to do, but but I think the library uh, uh, is going to have to have to make that 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 attempt. 
before you, just to add up one, and I also feel like this raises the issue, one of the things we've talked about assessments and sort of the sort of the slowness for special collections to sort of get onto the sort of the metrics issue. And I think this very issue of collecting for the future and the kind of use that special collections can sometimes get is one of the sort of disincentives for why special collections folks haven't been as active with assessment and measure uh, and measuring uh, use because you may have a collection, you know, a 100, 100 shelf foot collection that gets used twice a year, but those use could be a dissertation or a book could be very high impact use and that's one of the things that we've not been able to do I think a particularly good job of articulating is like not only just you know going beyond the sort of the, the raw numbers of what how what is being used and how much it's being used but what is the impact of that use uh, the same kind of thing with that collecting for the future you know there's usually that's a very intentional kind of thing that's being done but we don't necessarily have not done a good job of articulating and I think that's one of these things with having clear formulated collection policies and sort of looking at different ways to 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 measure measure impact I think is very important going going forward to justify. Also one thing is I often one of my concerns about our obsession with metrics, and I believe I have them too, is frequently we don't ask ourselves what does success look like. We gather lots of numbers and then we try to create a story around the numbers. Um, but frequently we haven't asked ourselves the basic question, what does a successful outcome look like? And then do these metrics document the the, the success or lack of success? And it's part of that story. We have right. to know what our story is. We have to know what the success looks like around that story. And then but surely it's not ourselves we should be asking that question. We should ask the people who are using us mm -hmm. for their sure. view of our impact. Oh, absolutely. Because that's the most powerful way right. of telling that story. Right. And before we let Scott jump in, I'll tell you that as an administrator <laughs> now, I find myself, every other word out of my mouth seems to be, write it down, send me an email. If your faculty or st students or researcher give you feedback or tell you how important that this re this has been to their research, you have to tell me so that I can surface it in the quarterly report or the next time I talk to the director or the next time I talk to a funder. Um, so I, I think telling our stories and getting the faculty and students and researchers to write it down, send an email, is really important. It's really important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just wanted to jump in and say, uh, A, I think Lisa's point is really important. When, when I came on in Illinois, one of the things I found in that you know, vast library system was there were a lot of things that nobody was talking about. And I would discover them in various ways. And I would ask the librarians about them. And the most common thing I heard back was, I didn't think you cared about that. Uh, and they didn't mean me personally, they meant the library administration because it had never been part of what we had asked them for, what we had collected. It wasn't part of what we reported to ARL. And, and so that, that I think was a real shift and it's exactly the shift that you're talking about. It's saying, no, I want to know everything. <laughs> I want to know about everything because I never know what's going to be useful. Which gets, I think, to another uh, point worth making and it has to do with assessment. And, and the obsession with metrics and with numbers, uh, which again uh, it, uh, comes to us uh, thanks to ARL, uh, among other <laughs> places. And there is another approach to assessment. And it, I, I discovered it in one of my favorite books, which is a British book uh, called Evaluating Library Services, I think it's called, by uh, Markless and Streetfield. Maybe some of the, uh, my British colleagues know this book. I really love this book. and. One of the things it talks about is a framework that comes out of the social sciences called illuminative assessment. An illuminative assessment is essentially a mechanism for getting at things that don't work well with numbers. You know, so when you say, this shelf was used three times, well, three isn't a very good number. But when you say, look what it was, look what the three things were, they illuminate something significant. And that something significant is not necessarily replicated a thousand times a year. But it's important and it gives breadth and depth to understanding what the numbers mean. And that's something that I think special collections, but many library services uh, benefit from if we think about it in that way. Last thing I wanted to ask was, since we are at OCLC, a lot of this, of course, is, is talking about sharing. And one experience that I was familiar with, this question of um, collecting for the future and, and what do we do and so on. When I was an education librarian, 
there was an area of history that was really very poorly served at many institutions, and it was uh, historical curriculum collections. And they were poorly served primarily because most curriculum collections serve present day need. They're for teachers to use to go in schools. You don't want something that's 40 years old. And a group of education librarians got together in the early part of the 2000s. And they created what was then called, I think, the National Education Network. And what it served to do was essentially as a clearinghouse for places that were weeding their historical collections because they didn't serve the curricular need. They weren't serving a research need. And they took up a lot of space, if you know curriculum collections, kits and textbooks and so on. And we started saying, who wants them? as opposed to discarding them or weeding them. And it essentially, you know, it came back to the Gutman Library at Harvard, the uh, Education Library at Illinois, and for at least a period of time, the Coverly Library mm -hmm. at Stanford. And these things just, they started to come together. And we knew that when we had to weed our curriculum collection of historical materials, we could call Harvard or we could call Illinois and say, do you want them? And what that meant, of course, was that a corpus was built up only in one or two places. But it meant that that content wasn't lost, but at the same time, we weren't forced to try and hold it in a number of different places. And in my experience, at least, that's a relatively unusual coming together of special collections and non-special collections librarians because these were, I think somebody said, these were special collections that were actually part of circulating collections, but very, very specialized. Um, and I'm wondering about, is that a piece of the puzzle where special collections librarians from around the country start to think about, well, you know, maybe this isn't the best for our collection anymore, but it would be a great compliment. Um, I would love to have this... Um, collection of cartoons, but you know, it would just be one little thing in my library. Whereas if I sent it to, I suggested it went to Ohio State, it's part of a context that is really rich. So I don't know if that's going on, but that was my question. That was exactly what we did do with our deaccession materials when we deaccessioned them. We found repositories that were building collections in those areas and transferred them. Well. I would like to, uh, to end the session. I don't know if, oh yeah, it's on. Um, Scott, you, you made the circle around, I think, um, and you gave us a nice last question to think about being generous and sharing collections. I think that's the future for us. And I would like to thank very much our speakers, our reactors, and you all, and yes. yes.